Today we're going to talk about politics and political sociology, and I'm going to give a series of lectures on understanding political life. Politics are everywhere. Uh, we constantly see signs of politics. In the United States, um, you see flags just about everywhere. Um, we also have people who argue over politics and political events like elections or the governments passing laws happen with an incredible regularity. Um, in these sets of lectures, I'm gonna help us try to understand what politics is and what, po what political sociologists study. And I want you to think about the different forms of politics in your everyday life. Some of this is experiences with the state. So sets of rules that the country that you live in uh, establishes. Um, this means the formal rules that they have and some of the informal rules that they have. But it also means encountering symbols of the state and of political life. Um, and it means uh, engaging with people and, and sometimes arguing with people about what we should do as a society in terms of the laws that govern us. I said at the very beginning that in the United States, and this picture of uh, the Statue of Liberty and the American flag is meant to evoke this, that the flag is everywhere. Um, if you travel abroad, one of the things that you'll note is that in other countries, the flag is not as present as it tends to be in the United States. Um, uh, so if you travel, for example, throughout Europe, um, there's a far greater reticence to fly the flag constantly. In part, this is because of a history of nationalism in um, Europe and some of the violence um, that's associated with such nationalism. Um, but I also think it's important to recognize that the United States is a deeply nationalistic country. Um, so for the Americans that are listening along or for those who are interested in the character of American life, I'll just note that America is deeply, deeply nationalistic. Um, and uh, we call this in the United States patriotism. But patriotism and nationalism are effectively the same word. And um, flags are, one indication of nationalism. So, you know, when I say that you see flags everywhere, I would encourage you to sort of, you know, as you walk around or drive around um, your neighborhood or the area that you live in the United States, to keep an eye out for flags. And what you'll see is that they tend to be in many, many places. Just about every single car dealership you'll pass by has a flag. Many, many businesses have flags up. Neighborhoods sometimes have flags to signal the entry into that neighborhood. You might also look to see where flags are not. And that when I said that neighborhoods tend to have flags that are up, it's very particular kinds of neighborhoods that have flags up. It tends to be suburban neighborhoods and it's overwhelmingly white neighborhoods. Um, so whites tend to have a deeply nationalistic sentiment. And this helps us understand some of the character of American nationalism character of American nationalism, which is not just about a love of nation, but it's about, you know, whites in particular love of nation and their association of themselves with that nation. So if you travel around black communities, you're not going to see the American flag flown as prominently. These are generalizations, of course, but they are also trends that you're likely to observe. So what is political sociology? Political sociology tries to understand government and power from a, a sociological perspective. It asks, how do people make states, places that we live in that govern us? How do people influence states? How do states make laws and policies? And how do people interact with states? You might list social processes that affect what governments do. So public opinion is one thing that affects what people do. People want more money for schools, for example, or how states influence one another. Um, when the state of Florida passes a law, it may influence whether or not Georgia passes a similar law. You might also think about the different kinds of government, from local government to national government to international forms of government. So you have local government like school boards, and you have national forms of government, 
like the Congress or um, um, the executive branch. And then there are international forms of government. So um, there are things like NATO and the United Nations. And these are all forms of politics. And so we could ask, how do people create these forms? How do people exert influence upon them? How is it that these different things from the school board to the executive branch to the United Nations make laws and policies? And on a kind of daily basis, how do all of us interact with the states that we are a part of? In order to understand this, we kind of need to take a little bit of a step back. And so the first thing I'd like us to think about are, is what are states? It's not obvious what they are and what they do. Do they pass rules? Do states have a police? Is it just brute force? Here, there's um, a classic definition of states that comes from our um, uh, good friend who we've had a lot of interactions with throughout these, uh, uh, course, Max Weber. And Weber has a classic definition of a state, which is a human community that claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of force within a given territory. So this is sometimes referred to as a monopoly on violence that what states do is they monopolize violence. Or in this other version of the definition, they are the legitimate use of force or violence over a given territory. I want you to think about three elements of Weber's definition. Legitimate, violence, territory. States have clear territorial bounds. Now, Sometimes they're not that clear because they're being contended over and often contention over the political bounds of a state results in war or can be interpreted as an act of war. But territory, the geographic bounds are essential to defining a state. So states are defined by the territories or the space that they control. Second thing, that states are engaged in, or another thing that states are engaged in, is legitimation. Legitimation is a cultural process, a process that says this group has the right to commit violence or the right to use force. So um, if we were having a lecture, let's say, in person, uh, not in um, uh, um, uh, 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 over, over the internet right now. Um, and let's just imagine that I'm standing on stage lecturing before you. And as I am, a group of uh, people in hooded masks runs up to the stage, puts me in handcuffs and rushes me out. Now, hopefully, maybe some of you would try and stop them um, and be like, wow, Seamus is getting kidnapped by a group of people. I can't believe that. Poor Seamus, I wonder what happened to him. So hopefully that would be your reaction. You would think like, oh my God, that's terrible what just happened to him. He just got kidnapped by a group of, of people. Like that's totally illegitimate. By contrast, if as I was lecturing on the stage before you, a group of police officers walked in and put me into handcuffs and walked me out, you would probably think something different. You would probably think, wow, I wonder what Seamus did in the first instance, there's no legitimacy to the act of violence against my person. And your impression would be that I am the victim of something. I was the victim of a kidnapping. In the second instance, when police would come and put me under arrest, they're not kidnapping me, they're putting me under arrest. And what you would think is, what did Seamus do? He must have done something to elicit this kind of reaction from the state. As you'll see from this perspective, what states do is legitimize their capacity to use force over people. They seek to say, we are legitimate 
when we commit violence against people in this population. By committing violence, they actually change the words. So it's not a kidnapping, it's an arrest. It's not that they do violence against you, it's that they imprison you. We can think about prison as a form of violence against our corporeal autonomy or our bodily autonomy, but in general, we think about it as something legitimate because there are processes and other things that help legitimize the state as committing violence. Critically, that legitimation of violence happens because states monopolize it. States are the only group, the only body in a society that can do this. And so what states say is, no one else can commit violence against a person in this territory other than us. We are the only group that can do this. Now, I want to make two points here about this process, actually three. The first is that violence is central to the state. So uh, the third element of our definition, territory, legitimation, and violence, is that violence is central to the process of the state. And in particular, it's monopolization, being the only people who can commit violence. The second is that this emerges out of, in part, a political philosophy. And I'm not gonna go into huge detail about this, but those, for those of you who are interested in it, you might look at the work of Thomas Hobbes, who wrote a book um, called Leviathan in um, uh, the 17th century. Hobbes was born in 1588 and um, died some 90 years later in the 1670s and wrote a classic book um, called Leviathan. And what it argued was that in order for us to be able to have a functioning society, somebody had to monopolize violence. Otherwise, we were going to commit violence against one another. So what states do is they monopolize violence, and that makes peaceful living possible. So if one group doesn't monopolize violence, all of us are constantly going to be concerned about the potential of other people to commit violence against us. And so the state becomes the critical place that monopolizes violence. And it does so not really as a pure expression of power, but as a way to make peaceful living possible between people. This is a theory. You should think about this as a theory. It's not a description of truth in the world, but it's partially where the ideas of contemporary states come from. Partially, not solely. That is that states should be places that insofar as they monopolize violence, allow for the peaceful living of groups of people because none of us fear violence from one another. We don't fear violence from one another because we know that only one group can commit violence and that's the state. So that's the second thing I wanted you to think about, the historical element of this. The third is, um, I want you to use this definition to think about different political events that are important to you or that are happening around you and ask what it is that's happening with those political events. So as I've said before, I'm speaking to you from July 2020. And one of the interesting things about July 2020 is that there have been massive political protest movements, particularly in the United States, uh, Black Lives Matter movements. Those protest movements are about whether or not the state's use of force against Black Americans is legitimate. They fundamentally are questioning the legitimacy of the American state. They are asking and saying, actually, the state's use of violence, how it is monopolizing violence is illegitimate. And so in some interpretation, the movement is a revolutionary movement. It's a revolutionary movement that says the US state is not a legitimate state because the way in which it's monopolizing violence is not a legitimate way of monopolizing violence and it needs to change. 
They're asking for, in effect, revolutionary change about the character of the, of the American state. So um, it's a very interesting moment. You could look though at other places in the world to see how challenges over the legitimation of violence are waged by protest groups who say, you do not have the right to monopolize violence. Nonviolent protests often challenge the state's legitimacy, the legitimacy in how they enact violence upon other groups. The state then is often in sort of question and conversation with people, members of that state. And its capacity to commit violence is not just defined by the overwhelming show of force. It requires also a cultural element, a cultural element of, of legitimacy. So it's the monopolization of violence is not quite sufficient to understanding the state because states could monopolize violence by being deeply, deeply oppressive. But the state can't just be deeply oppressive. It also has to engage in a process of legitimation. And that cultural process of legitimation often leaves moments of opportunity for people within states to challenge whether or not that use of force is legitimate. What seems like, I hope this is revealed, a very simple definition human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of force within a given territory reveals some very profound insights, I think, into human dynamics of what violence does and how the monopolization of violence may in fact be productive. And um, uh, 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 what the legitimacy of the state means as a cultural process. Finally, Again, I, I can't help but point to the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution here and how um, um, uh, often groups, extremist groups, have attitudes about their, the Second Amendment of the Constitution, I should be uh, clearer for people, is that amendment that allows Americans to have guns. Um, and it's about the right to bear arms in order to um, have a well-regulated militia. Um, uh, and it's interpreted as Americans just have the right to own guns. Interestingly, different versions or different interpretations of that Second Amendment to a degree help question the legitimacy of the monopoly of violence uh, by the state. Because part of what people claim who believe in extreme interpretations, in my view, of the Second Amendment is that the state does not have a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. Instead, individuals can own guns and commit violence themselves, and that that is a deeply important part of American life. In Previous lectures on violence, I noted that the US is a very violent country. And one way to think about that is the cultural tradition of this line of interpretation that the state of, of the US does not, in somewhat, gives up the monopoly of the legitimate use of violence, insofar as it's the Second Amendment to own guns is interpreted as people can own guns and commit violence with those guns in order to protect themselves. And so this um, uh, may be part of the fragility of the American state. Now, my take home that I want you to have here with all of those asides is there are sort of three critical elements to the state in Weber's definition, maybe four. Processes of legitimiz le legitimation, monopolization of violence, and territory. And those three elements you will see for every successful state. They, states engage in legitimation, and they try to legitimize what it is that they're doing. They monopolize violence, 
they say we are the only people who can commit violence and they have territorial boundaries. Now, where do states come from? I'm going to briefly outline three theories of state formation. One is a bar Marxist process, one is a Bellicist, which is war and institutions, and bureaucracy, and a third is cultural. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Bellicist, by the way, bellum is the Latin word for war. Uh, so uh, Bellicist just means war as a theory of state formation. The Marxists argue, uh, not surprisingly, hopefully this is familiar to you now by now, that economic processes are essential to understanding states. Every time, every time with Marxists, the argument is going to be that the economic conditions determine everything else. So what is culture? It's determined by economic processes. What is political life? It's determined by economic processes. What is religious life? It's determined by political pro uh, economic processes. What is family life? It's determined by economic processes. It may sound like a broken record. It kind of is a broken record, but it is a deep commitment from many Marxists. The mode and relations of production, how you produce things, generate all other aspects of a society. Before you think Marxists are ridiculous, I would encourage you to talk to a capitalist sometime. And capitalists deeply believe that the economy determines all. So um, Marxists aren't actually that far away from um, free market people who think that the economy should determine everything. So um, it's not as sort of ridiculous as a, of a position as it might first seem, uh, or maybe not as extreme um, uh, of a left-wing position as it might first seem. Uh, so what is the argument here? Uh, well, I'm going to draw upon the work of Perry Anderson in a book he wrote called Lineages of the Absolutist State. You don't need to know that, but given that I'm pulling on him, and I often draw not very little of the things that I talk about are my own work. So um, I want to at least name check people from time to time. Um, Anderson and other Marxists have argued that the modern state form emerged um, because of changes in the character of feudalism. And the argument goes something like this. Uh, there were twin threats that feudal lords were experiencing. Uh, feudal lords were people who had control over land and control over peasants who worked that land. And the twin threats that feudal lords faced were one, uh, peasant unrest in the countryside. Peasants who, you know, as centuries of extraction from land kept going and going, felt increasingly oppressed and um, like they were doing all the work and getting none of the reward. Um, and this happened, especially as um, land reforms didn't really uh, give them very much, as increases in agricultural production, uh, as transformations in agricultural production processes yielded greater efficiency, but few rewards for peasants. So um, uh, greater agricultural efficiency may have led to more stuff produced from the land, but peasants didn't get any of it. And so there was peasant unrest in the countryside. And then the second threat was um, the emergence of merchants um, uh, and uh, new kinds of classes that um, uh, uh, basically threatened the status position of the feudal lords. And so part of what happens, and there's also competition between feudal lords, competition over their territories. Part of what happens from these twin threats that feudal lords are experiencing from the countryside, from um, the new emerging merchant class who's becoming wealthier and wealthier, was that they, quote unquote, ran into the hands or the arms of the monarch. So feudal lords had huge amounts of autonomy over the spaces that they controlled. Um, in some interpretations, there are like dozens of kings in England, kings over their particular territory. But as they begin to be threatened um, by peasant unrest and by increasing competition from merchants and to some degree from one another, they began to run into the arms of the monarch. The monarch, the king, the person who really becomes king over a much broader territory 
the king of all of the lords, was really just a lord, um, but happened to be then the most powerful lord who helped address these concerns of political unrest in the countryside and merchants through things like taxation, et cetera. Um, but the central thesis here is that changes in economic conditions produced new political structures. So changes in the economic conditions in, in, in relationship to the economic position of peasants and their expectations and the rise of merchants and their actions and their activities and their increasing power relative to other feudal lords, feudal lords being people who are dry, relying on agrarian wealth or food and uh, merchants who are relying primarily on trade. So they're engaged in different aspects of the economy. These economic transformations produced really strong, quote unquote, absolutist states. Absolutist states meaning states where kings are quite powerful. So from a Marxian perspective, states emerge in part because, or actually in whole, because of economic transformations. Changes in the economy lead to changes in the state. So you don't need to know a lot about European feudalism, I suspect most of you don't, to hopefully get the idea that as economic conditions change and economic interests transform, new kinds of states emerge. Now, Marx doesn't think about this on the small scale, like, oh, there's a new tech economy, and so the state is changing. He thinks about this on a huge global historical scale, like we moved from capitalism and a feudal agrarian economy, I mean, excuse me, we moved from feudalism with an agrarian uh, uh, economy to capitalism, an industrial economy. That's a big, big, big change. And the result of that change was also to produce new states. States are the consequence of changes in economic processes. Bellicist theories of the states are a little bit closer to Weber um, and argue that war making is essential to state formation. So war, war, war. That's what you should think about when you hear Bellicist theories of the state. And they, what Bellicist theories of the state note is that those states that were most successful are the states that were the best at waging war. Pretty simple observation when you think about it. Like who survives? People who are really good at waging war. This builds off the idea of a state as the monopoly over the legitimate use of violence over a given territory, but focuses on those territorial edges and says, what are the states that gonna, are gonna fail? States that can't protect their territorial bounds. And so states are defined by their war-making capacity. In the last instance, if you can't protect your territory, you are not going to be a successful state. So who's good at waging war? What makes a good war-making state? Again, all of these theories are looking at a time period of sort of, you know, roughly 1600 to uh, 1800. Um, um, and so, you know, this is back in the day, think of, you know, think, before planes and uh, ships and, well, there were ships, but not like uh, battleships um, to the same degree. Um, so before planes and like um, uh, contemporary armies with drones, I should say, things like that. Um, uh, so what were these successful war-making states do? Well, people who are really good at war have armies. If I'm a feudal lord, and what I have as my army is a group of peasants, it's not gonna be very good. Why? Because peasants aren't trained to fight. They don't know how to fight. They may be good at like, you know, punching one another and there may be some who are particularly strong and some who are particularly weak, but they're like generally gonna be pretty old. They're generally gonna be pretty weak. You know, it's not like they are given a lot of resources um, and they don't train to fight. So. People who are really good at waging war have armies. Armies are groups of people whose entire job it is to wage war. 
But what's the problem with armies? Well, there are two problems with armies. The first is that they're expensive. What do you have to do to get a group of people who, whose only job it is to wage war? You've got to take them out of agricultural production and just pay them to exist to fight. That's not an easy thing to do. It requires a good amount of money. So the first problem of having an army is money. What else do armies require? They require discipline or they need to have like a way that they're run or administered. And so um, this is the second problem with armies is an administrative problem. And so the Bellicists argue that states that are most successful at waging war solved two problems. The first problem was the money problem. And the second problem was the administration problem. The money problem required making sure that there was enough in terms of productive capacity in your country that you could extract surplus from it and you could actually extract that surplus. So like basically how do you tax people? How do you make sure that there's enough surplus that you can tax it in order to pay for your army? So there's an economic process that states have to develop and solve to create surpluses, to create economic conditions of surplus, and then to extract that surplus. Extracting the surplus is part of your bureaucracy, part of your administrative capacity. And then you have to administer your army. You have to find a way to administer them effectively. And so the war-making people basically argue that um, a kind of fiscal development, um, uh, uh, economic development plus um, bureaucratic capacity defined those states which were the most successful at war. So the war-making states were states that attended to economic development and also developed institutions that allowed them to extract surplus money from people and developed an organizational capacity to run an army. The final view of states is a cultural approach. Um, and this cultural approach uh, emerges from um, kind of the work of Michel Foucault uh, um, and says something like this. Well, you know, exerting force against people is not an easy thing. Like, you know, um, it, it actually is really, really costly to regulate people and to constantly exert force or monopolize violence against them. You know what's way more efficient than that? Getting people to do it themselves. So the people who are the easiest to rule are people who engage in self-control, who actually internalize the cultural logic of the state and control themselves. If they do that, it becomes way, way easier to govern. So we need to look at the legitimation process of the state. We need to look at how it is that states legitimize themselves and what are the set of people who self-regulate. If the state has to constantly commit violence against people to get people in line, it is absolutely exhausting for that state and that state is unlikely to be successful. Think of lots of authoritarian states today. So, you know, um, uh, the North Korean state might be a good example of something like this, a state that engages in huge amounts of social control over the population, but that's very, very challenging for that state. It actually is like hugely costly. And so what would be more successful? Well something the North Korean state does as well, which is try to figure out how can we get people to regulate themselves so that we don't actually have to regulate them. I've said this idea before, but um, uh, uh, I'll repeat it here. Michel Foucault has an idea of docile bodies. Um, and Foucault's idea is that uh, one of the things that happens in the contemporary world is that our bodies become more quote unquote docile. 
Um, so the example I used in earlier lectures was you're all sitting right now in chairs, like, and like sitting in a chair isn't easy to do. If you interact with like kids from the ages of two to six or seven, getting them to sit down for as long as you've been sitting down to listen to this lecture is a nightmare. You actually may want to walk around right now, but part of the process of turning you into an adult has been making your body more docile, actually disciplining your body. And so cultural uh, 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 approaches to state formation, some of them look at the process of discipline and how discipline changed over time. And people began to internalize systems of discipline. This work comes from a uh, scholar, Phil Gorski, um, G-O-R-S-K-I. And Phil Gorski um, was, sort of really interested in Protestantism and how Protestantism increasingly led to self-regulation rather than external re re regulation. And Gorski's argument went something like this. If you look to see uh, uh, what ca Catholicism is structured like, it's partially that other institutions mediate your relationship with God and those institutions, the church, the Catholic church regulates you. So the church is the thing that tells you how to atone for your sins. Like, you know, you've got to do a certain set of things. But this means that there's an institution whose job it is to regulate you. Protestantism is a little bit different. Protestantism has this idea of a personal relationship with God. And what happens within Protestantism is that people become self-regulating. Rather than have the church tell them what to do, they internalize religious ideas and do it themselves. They actually discipline themselves rather than have an external institution discipline. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because if people become self-disciplining, if they start to discipline themselves, a consequence is that they become easier to rule. And this makes the effectiveness of states far, far greater. States become far more effective when people internalize the rules and regulate themselves so that the state doesn't have to commit violence against people to get them in line. They just do it themselves. They self-regulate. These three different theories, as I said before, are not, and I'll repeat that, not um, like totally competing. Some instances they're explaining different phenomenon in different places at different time periods. But there are three different ways to think about where states came from. One is that states came from changes in economic processes or the emergence of, of like capitalism led to new kinds of states like democracies. The other is that war and territorial defense is really important and the emergence of capitalism is also super important here, which is having financial resources that help you wage war, but also new institutional and organizational forms where you can successfully extract money and efficiently administer an army. And the new bureaucratic form created increasing levels of efficiency, which meant that states survived. Finally, the cultural approach thinks about how changes in the cultural life of people, in particular how Protestantism was essential to self-regulation, fundamentally transformed the capacity of states because instead of having to do all this work to get people to fall in line, people did that work upon themselves. And so states had a much easier time dealing with their population. People just did what they were supposed to do because they disciplined themselves. And this led to far more successful states. Okay, we now have a sense of what states are um, and how to define them. Now we're gonna dive in, um, in other parts of this, uh, the subsequent lectures to, um, uh, we, won't, we won't go as slowly, we're gonna kind of speed through different sets of things um, uh, 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 um, about uh, how political sociologists think about the world.